Welcome to Liberty Online. We are so happy you've decided to join us for our message series, Playing It Safe. Whilst we've had to take a pause with in-person services, connect groups are still running and you are always welcome to join. They meet virtually via Zoom every other Tuesday evening and are a great opportunity to meet others from the church and join in with a short discussion, usually on the message series. To express an interest, just visit our website, libertycenter.org.uk forward slash connect and we'll be in touch. But for now, let's hear from Phil as he talks about playing it safe. Thanks for joining us today here at Liberty Online. And we are in a different venue today. You might have noticed we are with a small team of people just to bring you online services at home. Thank you to the URC Church here for giving us their venue this morning. And we've got old school Lecton looking good. And we've even got, oh, we've got an organ in the background, which is cool. Like in the look of that. And so we are in part two of the series called Playing It Safe. We've done part one in our speed services in the Carnegie Room a few weeks back, but uh, part two of Playing It Safe. And a couple of weeks ago when we done that, we eased you in. And uh, so we've been taking a bit of a long run up uh, to, to talk about this, this topic, but we're going to pick up the pace today and then we'll pick up the pace and the heat in week three and finally finish off with a raging inferno in week four. And so I'm going to do a 10 second recap because it was two weeks ago. And so here we go. 10 second recap is I said that most of us play it safe most of the time. And I think that's true. You might disagree with me. If you missed it, go back and watch it on YouTube. Um, and we asked the question, should we play it safe? There you go, you're up to date, that was it. So 10 second recap, we're all up to speed. And so here we go. Week two, playing it safe. Thank you for joining us, here we go. Before we get into the, to the meat of it though, I've got a story um, that I wanna tell you or, or more of a, an experience that, of my childhood. Cause I don't know about you, but it's only one, two, three, it's five weeks till Christmas. Oh, we haven't got very enthusiastic people in the room here. It's five weeks till Christmas. A bit more enthusiasm there. But I remember Christmas as a kid was my favourite time of year. For my kids, they love Christmas. But um, for me, Christmas as a kid, um, was it was great. The food was great, the family and all that sort of stuff. But the one thing that I loved was the games. I loved playing games, all different types of games. We play like five or six different games, Pictionary, all that sort of stuff. But one of them that some of us loved, my brothers and sisters, some didn't, was Monopoly. We've got a mixed bag of response in the room. Some people love it, some people hate it. It's the winners who love it. And the people who never win who hate it. But me, I have not yet lost in the Williams household. And so I've been, I've, since living with Steph and being married for what's that, 16 years now, never lost a game of Monopoly. And when the kids come along, I've never lost a game of Monopoly. And you know, the best bit about it is now is my nine-year-old son, Joel. The best bit is when he smashes mummy. <laughs> <laughs> at Monopoly. I love it. Because she's not here, so I can say this. She doesn't understand how to win. <laughs> she doesn't get the principle of how to win. Even during playing, even though I've told her this, that she shouldn't play like this, she'll say things like, I won't buy that because I don't want to waste my money just in case, you know, I land on someone else. I want to save the money. So I'm, I want to play it safe. And uh, like I said, she's not here, so I can say that. And uh, she'll smack me in the face when she watches this online. But I get the rationale. I do understand the rationale behind her playing the game like that. Because um, essentially she thinks if I, if, if I don't play it safe, then I could lose everything. I want you to think about that with the game of Monopoly. If you think the, the rationale is it's normal, it's natural. If I don't play it safe, if I don't play this game safely, then I could lose everything I have. But she doesn't get that in Monopoly... Essentially, if you always play it safe, you will always fail to win. And we know that about Monopoly. If you're good at Monopoly, if you lose all the time in Monopoly, this is what you don't understand, is that if you always play it safe, you will always fail to win. And I think, and maybe you'll disagree, but I think it's the same in life. So can I suggest that playing it safe is not safe? In our life, playing it safe is not safe. I'd even go to say this, that playing it safe is dangerous. In our life, if, and I want to put context to that. I know most of our life can be mundane and we play it safe in lots of regards. Like I said, most people play it safe most of the time. But if we play it safe 
all the time. I would say that is dangerous. Playing it safe is dangerous. And you might ask me at home, like you might disagree and say, well, are you saying be reckless? Shouldn't we play it safe to be a good steward like God might want us to be? And I would argue, and, we, and I talked to this with a good friend of mine on, uh, in, in our connect groups this week about stewardship. And I would argue just as being reckless is not being a good steward, is that so is always playing it safe, is not being a good steward. If you're, if you're reckless all the time, that's not being a good steward. But the same, if you always play it safe, I would argue that is not being a good steward. Let's turn to uh, some words of Jesus. Matthew 25, and I'm reading from the NLT. It's my favorite version at the minute. From verse 14, it says this. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a man going on a long trip. So Jesus was given this story. He called together his servants and entrusted them with, uh, with money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one. He gave two bags of silver to another and one bag of silver to the, to the last. And it says this, dividing it in proportion to their ability. He then left on his trip. And you might have heard this story many times before. In verse 16, it says, The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money, and he earned five more. That's a risky business, investing it in whatever thing there is to invest in. You could have loss. It says in verse 17, The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver, I want you to think about this. The servant who, who received the one bag of silver, who in this scripture would say had the, the least ability, if you like, but he had the ability for one. It says that he dug a hole <laughs> in the ground and hid his master's money. And after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account, to give an account of how they used his money. And it says, when we jump down to verse 23, and he's talking to the two that had invested and risked it and not played itself safe. It says this in verse 23. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So I'll give you more responsibility, many more responsibilities, it says. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver come and said, master, I knew you were a harsh man harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. And check this, it says, I was, what does it say? I was afraid I would lose your money. I, would I was afraid I'd lose something. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. I played it safe. I'd done the thing that I thought would, would yield no gain, but I wouldn't lose anything. So I hid it in the earth. Look, and he said, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. He wasn't expecting that. Can I tell you? He was not expecting that. You wicked and lazy servant. And it goes on to say, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gather crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? That would, it was well within your ability just to go a few more meters, go to the high street, go to Nationwide, Lloyd's. There are other great banks out there as well. And deposit in a really low interest account. At least, it says, at least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. The one who had five who gained five. It says this in verse 29, check it out. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance but from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. And so in this parable, this, this parable that Jesus taught, the servant did not use well what the master had given him. All the other guys who'd done well, they actually didn't play it safe. They put something on the line to get reward, to get abundance. Where the one who had one coin didn't use what the, sir, the master had given him. He played it safe. And, and what was his rationale? Why? Just like Steph on Monopoly, fear of losing the thing that 
you, they already had. You know, in Monopoly, you start with one 500, what is it, four 100s, a 50, a 20, so whatever, you start with a certain amount of money. If you finish the game and you've got the same amount of money, you haven't won <laughs> because everyone else would have outplayed you. And it's not that we're in, in competition with anyone else in the world, but we are given something to take responsibility for in our life. God has given you something, your life, to take responsibility for. And out of fear, he didn't use what God gave him. Maybe you're not using what God has given you out of fear of losing something. And maybe not your life, but something. Reputation, finance, time, reputation with friends or with colleagues or, or whatever it is. But perhaps like this servant, if you always play it safe and don't put on the line that which God has given you, you'll never receive what God wants you to get or what he wants to give you in the future. If you never put on the line, if you're always playing it safe, maybe God can't give you and bless you in a way that he wants to. And so I want to ask you, what talents, and it's talking about talents in terms of money in this, in this story, but what talents or skills or resources, including money, has God given you and you're playing it safe? I want to ask you that. What, is, what has God given you in your life and you're playing it safe all the time and burying them in the ground so you don't lose anything? Get judged so you don't fail, so you don't get hurt. All the things we talked about in week one. What areas of your life are you doing that in? Because I think, I would say this, that God wants a return on his investment in you. God's invested in you so much. He sent his only son to die for you individually. He paid the cost he paid everything and I think he wants a return on the investment he's put in you and it seems to me in monopoly in life in our walking out our purposes with God if you risk nothing you gain nothing honestly if you risk nothing that you gain nothing and I want you to think about this. Maybe you're not a Christian at home and you're just listening to me because you know me from somewhere or someone's forwarded you or they've liked it on Facebook and you happen to be watching. But I think you'd agree with this, that generally in life, without taking risks, you really, rarely ever get anything of value. Without taking risks, you rarely get anything of value. You know, my wife's not here, so she can't confirm this. But Steph risks, risked being rejected when she asked me out. It was that way around, by the way. But then again, I risked being rejected when I asked her to marry me. I put it on the line. I wasn't playing it safe. You risk something. You re risk rejection. And I got something great because I didn't play it safe. You know, me and Steph as a couple, we risked so much when we took on the church at 25 years old. You know, in, in building church in our local community, we, we risked wasting our time and energy and resource when we launched Edge Youth all them years ago that was um, very popular in the town. We saw many, many people come into church and get to know Jesus, and many are still in our church as young adults today. We, ri we risked no one turning up when we launched Flourish Conference uh, in the region to invite churches from all across different denominations and different backgrounds to come. We didn't play it safe. You know, in Scripture, you know, so often people didn't play it safe around Jesus. Even, even the, the centurion, you might know the story that, that when he approached Jesus and said, hey, I've got a servant who's paralyzed at home. I'd, can you heal him? And uh, he didn't play it safe when Jesus said, you know what, shall I come? I'll come and see him. And the centurion said, no, no, no. Check this. Talk about not playing it safe. No, don't bother. All you've got to do is say the word and it'll happen. You haven't got to come and see the dude. You're amazing, mate. I, can you, would you have done that? I'd have been like, whatever you say, you're saying to come, I'll just follow you. I'll follow your rules. This guy didn't play it safe when he just, with extraordinary faith, said, no, you ain't got to bother doing that, Jesus. You can just say the word and it'll happen. And Jesus was amazed. Scripture says it was amazed. He was amazed by that level of faith, that level of not playing it safe. Think about the woman with the issue of blood. She didn't play it safe when she was desperate and, and touched Jesus. She, she pushed her way through the crowd and, and probably in a culture would have been sort of not in a good place there. And yet Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? I think he, he, he knew what was going on. But he's like, who touched me? And everyone else was like, wasn't me, wasn't me. And yet she was bold enough. She didn't play it safe when she said, it was me. 
and, he, and it says in Scripture that she was immediately healed just because she didn't play it safe. And lastly, when some, some friends took a paralyzed man, Jesus was speaking in a house and they took a paralyzed man and they couldn't get in. It was so busy. There were so many crowds. And uh, Jesus was in this house teaching and, and they couldn't get in. And so they decided with this paralyzed man, this group of friends, to climb the roof carrying their friend on this on this bed I can't even imagine the picture of doing it it'd be ridiculous I'm sure it was both funny at the time and and quite stressful at the same time they were desperate for healing in this man and and they made a hole in the roof they smashed through imagine we've actually got a hole in the roof today and water's dripping through in this room but imagine just a group of people while we're doing church if you like start smashing through the roof all the all the rubble falling through they they smashed a hole and they lowered this guy down they took a risk They took a risk, one, of being prosecuted for damage to property. They took a risk that they might fall down. Imagine that. Imagine dropping your mate. (laughs) Sorry, Dave. (laughs) Imagine that. And then say, Jesus, while you're there, can you fix that broken leg too? They took a risk. (laughs) They took a risk. Uh, If they played it safe, I want you to think about it. If they played it safe, he would have remained on that bed. But instead, he heard the words from Jesus, get up. He was forgiven and then he was healed. And I say, if you live a life always playing it safe, never risking, never stepping out the boat, always burying that talent in the ground, you will fail to win. And you'll fail to really live. Because I think, I don't know about you, but I think there's a difference between existing and living. There's a difference between being alive and living. And I don't want to just exist. I want to live. It says in Scripture that Jesus came to give you life and life abundantly. And even us as a church, I don't want us to be a church that only exists. Decades of copy and paste with playing it safe. We're just here. But I want to thrive. I want us as a church, as a family, as a a community to thrive, to grow and to be a hub in our community. And if I'm honest, I'm bored of playing it safe. (laughs) I'm bored of playing it safe. And considering the fact that playing it safe is so dangerous, I encourage us all in this room, and if you're watching at home, to stop playing it safe. Amen. Thank you for joining us for part two of this message series. If you want to catch up on part one, then head over to our YouTube channel. In fact, even if you don't, head over there anyway and subscribe so you never miss a message. That's all for now. Have a great week.